Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog. This is episode 121, and I actually did it. I was getting a little worried uh, because of how I've been feeling lately that I wasn't going to actually be able to review all three of these books leading up to Venomized. And uh, Venomized is the new book coming out uh, at your local comic stores tomorrow, which is Wednesday, April 4th. And uh, and that book is going to be written by Colin Bunn and art by Ivan Coella. It's amazing, you know, stuff that they worked on in Venomverse. I thought they knocked it out of the park with that book. So to see this team come back together for a new story where this group called the Poisons enters the Marvel Universe and starts infecting people uh, with, you know, what they are and, and uh, delivering them symbiotes first and then poisoning them and poisoning those symbiotes and taking control of them and making them a hive mind. Uh, of course, with that threat, the only person to save them is Venom and possibly the X-Men and other Marvel characters who will possibly get symbiotes of their own as well. Uh, so we saw some of that in Venomverse and Edge of Venomverse, but before we figure out how the Poisons got here, we got to talk about this storyline, which is Poison X. And I'm sorry for the glare. I have a lot of lights going on here. So uh, I'll have the images just pop up on screen here of the five covers. And I know normally, uh, you know, I show interior artwork uh, for, you know, from each issue and stuff like that. But I'm going to be pretty honest with you guys. You know me. I don't like to bash on things. I don't want to speak negatively about stuff. But I do want to be honest about my opinion. And, uh, and I really don't have a lot of positive stuff to say about Poison X, unfortunately. So this may not be a long video because if I'm going to talk negatively about something, I don't want to talk about it for very long. Um, the basic storyline for this story, and it crosses over from X-Men Blue, which is a title written by Colin Bunn, and Two Issues of Venom. Uh, it's a five-part story, and it's going to be coming out in trade paperback very soon. So if you want it in that format, and to be honest with you, I'm probably still going to buy it in that format so that I could have all of the you know, Venomverse and Colin Bunn stories all in graphic novels. Uh, I think that'll look good on my bookshelf. And plus, I don't mind supporting things um, you know, if I have the money to, even if I'm not a fully on board if they feel like they're part of like a bigger thing. And so like this is definitely a middle chapter. I think that's my biggest complaint about this storyline is that really the reason I don't like it is that it just feels very like, you know, okay, we ha we have to kind of set this up uh, before we get to Venomized. So we have to set up a little bit of something and, uh, you know, to, you know, hopefully get people excited to people who are reading X-Men, maybe get them into the Venom book uh, and try to, you know, cross pollinate a little bit more and get people who are interested in the X-Men characters, maybe interested in this crossover. So I totally get it from a business standpoint, but then when you read it, it feels like that. It just feels like a, a decision made by committee. Uh, and the biggest thing about this is that there's like four, three or four artists drawing these five issues. And half these issues, half these comic books in one issue alone have two artists in them and, you know, in those issues. And so it already feels like a jarring cluster. Uh, there is, I think, six editors on just one of the books. I think this one here, the X-Men Blue Annual, I think that one has six, like two main editors and four assistant editors or something like that. And then some of the other books have as many, like anywhere between four and six editors. And it feels like that. It feels like just people throwing their ideas in here and it just feels very chaotic so before we i break it down of like you know what i think they didn't do right or where i think they could have done a little bit better let's just talk about the main plot and the main plot is essentially that the the x-men and what really frustrates me is that this is the first time that the x-men not the first time that they've met the x-men and the symbiotes because that happened i think in christos gage's spider-man and x-men run uh, but this is the first time we get like a legit crossover between the x-men and venom and to my, you know, to my regret, I actually don't like the five kid X-Men, like the ones from the past. And that's what it is. It's Angel, Beast, Iceman, uh, Marvel Girl, or Jean Grey, and Cyclops, uh, you know, when they were kids, when they first became the X-Men. You know, years ago, Brian Michael Bendis had this stupid idea to bring those five X-Men into this universe. And ever since then, I just have not liked X-Men comics. And I'm a huge X-Men fan. I have an X-Men tattoo on my arm, and I pick up the books every time a new writer comes on, hoping I'll like it, and I just I just fall away. I don't. Uh, I will say Colin Bunn's X-Men Blue, though, I still do read, and I like some of the stuff he's done. And I like the introduction of, like, the new Wolverine that they have on the team, James from the Ultimate Universe. And then also... Um, uh, or Jimmy, what's his, I think his name is Jimmy, and Bloodstorm from the, the Havoc Mutant X universe. And I really like that. And I think that's where Colin Bunn's strengths are, is uh, referencing things and, and and pulling them back in, and, you know, and trying to fold them into current stories. And I think he's pretty good at that. Uh, but in this, it, I didn't get that feeling. And plus those two characters I just mentioned, Bloodstorm and Jimmy, who I think would have been a great addition to this, this storyline, they weren't even in it. Uh, so it's literally just the five X-Men and Venom and Cyclops is like the story starts with him at the Xavier Institute. He has his like like iPad or something on him, and he's 
getting a signal from space. So obviously technology in the Marvel Universe is amazing. Uh, and his dad, who is a, a Corsair from the Star Jammers, if you don't know who the Star Jammers are, they're like these uh, kind of like gar Guardians of the Galaxy in a way. Like they're these, uh, you know, swashbuckling space pirate people. And, uh, and Cyclops' dad is actually the leader of them. And uh, he is like with this girl named Hebzibah, and there's like this guy named Chaud or something. I think that's how you say his name. I used to call him Chode. Uh, I never really cared too much for the Star Jammers, but the animated series I thought did a pretty good job with them, and it made me care about the Cyclops character a little bit more to show some emotion coming out of him, other than just his feelings for Jean. And so that's what I was kind of hoping was going to be the focus of this was his dad gets captured. The Star Jammers get captured by symbiotes um, at the beginning of this storyline, and so Cyclops is like, oh, what well, you know, like what happened to my dad what's going on and he saw like the image of the symbiote and he's like wait i know kind of what that is that that looks a lot like venom and venom apparently lately is trying to be a good person he's going around fighting bad guys so maybe you know the x-men can go try to recruit him get some information out of him and then uh, we can go find my dad together and uh, of course cyclops he's trying to be optimistic and think venom will come along and gene gray's like look i think as the leader of the x-men because marvel girl she's like the leader of this team uh, along with magneto who also doesn't appear in this book uh, they although they mention him so it's like all the interesting things and all the interesting dynamics they could have had like magneto and venom in a room together like all that's gone because uh they just wanted to focus on these five kids and when i th i thought colin bunn was focusing on it for a reason which to me seemed like the most obvious which is a, a young boy uh, who, who, you know, is, has a connection with his father and the father's gone. And I thought on some personal level, Venom might have, you know, felt for Scott on that. He would have been like, hey, uh, you know, I want I want to help this kid maybe, or I, maybe he reluctantly wants to help the kid because he's like, you know, I never got accepted by my father. This kid did, and now his father could be dead. Uh, plus, on top of that, you have the added mystery of the symbiotes. He's like, all right, a symbiote attacked him. Uh, I'm kind of interested in that. The suit meanwhile is telling eddie look it's it's clintar race it's a symbiote you know we should get involved with this and eddie's like no screw you suit and he's just acting like a full-on jerk for no reason and like i said on an emotional level i felt like there should have been something that could have resonated in eddie to make him go you know what i'll go with you but instead what the suit does is it knocks eddie out and willingly goes with uh the the x-men and so basically eddie gets kidnapped and he gets taken into outer space by the x-men to go look for the star jammers and so of course when he wakes up he's pissed off he doesn't like what's going on he's snapping at beast and iceman he's yelling at them and then gene gray and cyclops are like look trying to calm him down but again as they're trying to reason with him not once does Colin Bunn reference the fact that Eddie has daddy issues and uh, and that seeing Cyclops wanting to you know help his father that doesn't click in Venom at all it doesn't click in Eddie at all and so it, it drives me nuts because I'm like there's a story right there just waiting to be told and you're not telling it and it and it's frustrating on like a lot of levels uh, and then meanwhile back on Clintar they actually show the home world of the alien symbiote and the symbiotes are like kind of moving around and it's kind of like this really uh, awesome like ballet like the art i thought on this page in particular was really good uh and the, it's kind of like this ballet of the symbiotes moving around on their planet but then you have this guy who's hunting symbiotes and he's capturing them uh and it turns out he's uh, like you know uh, inducing them with chemicals to make them more aggressive or to make them more docile or, you know depending on what his buyers want so there are literally buyers some buyer out there that has contacted him and said look we want you to bring us a ton of symbiotes. We want uh, five for this mission. We want this for this over here, and you need to bring them to us. And so he's on the you know planet, and he's hunting these symbiotes down. Uh, and then uh, and it turns out he actually has a connection to the Venom symbiote because when he sees Eddie, he says, "Hey, I know you. Like uh, I haven't seen you in a long time, but I know you." And Eddie's like, "What?" And the suit is even like what like he said he knows us but he's not you know we don't remember him and uh so that was cool because i was like oh there's a setup so again colin bunn he's like finds a way to like really hook you with like these little moments but i think with just the amount of editors on this book and the amount of artists and, the, and probably the amount of juggling they had to do to get these books out on time because i think one of these issues came out every like week or two or every two weeks uh so i'm sure it wasn't easy to like you know juggle all of this but uh, I think they made it even more complicated. I think they they could have just taken this. They seemed to take out all the other characters, Magneto, Jimmy, Bloodstorm, and I thought they were simplifying it so that with working with all these writers and artists and editor, or this one writer and all these editors and artists, that they were doing that to focus. And the book does not feel focused to me. Um, and so pretty much from there, 
you know, Eddie is helping the X-Men uh, reluctantly. The X-Men get symbiotes of their own. So the five symbiotes that were, you know, captured, I think they were meant to be for the Star Jammers. They end up on the five X-Men kids. And so it amplifies their powers. Cyclops gets wounded. So his symbiote, he's keeping it on even more so to heal himself uh, because the symbiote obviously can heal wounds. And so uh, so that's kind of the benefit to him. And, uh, and the team is just like just getting into these battles uh just just willy-nilly <laughs> like it's just like like nothing organically feels like it's moving to one place or the other and even colin bunn brings back this character that he co-created with uh, cm punk back when they did the drax the destroyer series uh called thriller killer or killer thrill or something like that and she's like this really lame character she's like this space pirate lady uh who lost her arm and now she has a symbiote of her own she has a new crew she gave them all symbiotes and uh, and they're going around you know uh working with uh this this, this crazy guy who is capturing symbiotes and they're all kind of working together and they have a buyer and they're trying to capture other symbiotes to bring to their buyer uh, and they kept mentioning this mysterious buyer so you're kind of like wondering who, who it is but then in issue three at the end um after the after venom and the x-men like they take down uh the the bounty hunter the guy who was like capturing the symbiotes they take him down and turn him into the nova Corps. Uh, he gets broken out of the cell at the nova Corps facility by Craven the Hunter, who is in a poison outfit. So it's a Craven Hunter. I don't even know if he's from our reality or the other reality, but he has a symbiote on him and it's covered in poison. So uh, and he says like, "Hey, I'm here to unify, and and, and you're you're the one we contacted to help us gain symbiotes, and you know where this one symbiote in particular is, like Venom. So I want you to help me with like a, another hunt." And so the guy's like, "All right, fine, I'll I'll help you the best I can." So uh, so that kind of sets that up, and then that kind of goes away for almost an entire issue. In issue four. Uh, again, it's just back to uh, Venom and the X-Men trying to go to, you know, save the Star Jammers from uh, Killer Thrill or whatever her name is. <laughs> uh, they're trying to save, you know, the, the Star Jammers from her and her crew. And they show up and they start kicking the crap out of everybody and they have their symbiote, so they're super powered and everything seems to be going their way. But then right at the end, the poisons show up and they capture Jean Grey and turn her into a poison. Uh, so now that she has a symbiote on her, she's primed to be, you know, taken down. So her and thriller kill they're both turned into poisons and so those groups unite and they attack the X, the remaining four x-men members and venom which are just pretty much the guy characters left and uh, and they're left you know to fight jean gray and the others but jean gray is so powerful that they are not they're not even a match for her and so uh what they're able to do is they're able to escape get out into the the you know the blackness of space and and you know kind of limit themselves out there and, and battle out there but then archangel who has fire wings i guess in this in this version that's that's a long story to explain uh but in this version um you know the younger uh, archangel he'd lost his wings so his wings are like fire wings and so that he has to sacrifice the symbiote and the symbiote says it's okay you can do it because there's like a, a little hatchling on his back and he's like yeah that's fine i'll burn it off it's cool and so he's like the symbiote's like just kill me now so you can go save our friends and the other symbiotes so warren has to make like this decision which i'm like that's a great emotional point for the character that isn't even set up at all. Like they, it's like it, nothing builds to that. So when he does it, you're like, oh, that's could have been really dramatic. And then of course nothing. And so Archangel flies out, grabs the X-Men, brings them onto the ship with the Star Jammers, and they take off. Uh, and then Jean and the other poisons are left like you know floating in space. And then they get pulled into their ship. And you find out that the the poisons have entered this Marvel universe. And what they did was they went to Clintar and cleaned it out of symbiotes. So when Corsair and the X-Men, they decide to part ways and you know they, the X-Men give up their symbiotes, they're like, hey, take these three back because obviously Gene's gone and uh, Archangel's, uh, his symbiotes destroyed. Scott's like, take our three symbiotes back to Clintar and warn them about, you know, danger coming. And uh, and then, you know, we're going to go back to Earth and warn the heroes of Earth uh, that these poisons are, because Eddie Brock's obviously like, look, these things are going to come for us. They're going to take us down. And so uh, we need to get back to Earth. And so, you know, you know the symbiotes leave, you know, uh, Star Jammers, they take those three symbiotes, they go back to Clintar, they find it empty, and they're like, oh, crap, uh, we're too late. Uh, these are the last three symbiotes, so we'll hang on to them because it looks like their entire planet was was uh, captured and so yeah that's kind of the setup for Venomize and like I said this all this feels like is a setup because really no issue feels like it organically goes into the next everything seems to retread things they have the same conversations over and over and my biggest problem with them is the way it's written because in the first issue you have Eddie and the symbiote talking back and forth and even though Eddie is saying things he shouldn't even be saying as a character because like I said on an emotional level he should kind of feel a little bit for what Scott's going through um, you know and, and and kind of sympathize at least a little bit uh, and so the fact that he does 
doesn't, it's just like, all right, I guess, it, well, at least it makes the banter between the suit and Eddie more interesting, but then that goes away, and the next issue is narrated by Cyclops, which I get, I, I get a little bit because it's in an X-Men issue, but X-Men Blue was the first issue, and that's what the one, X-Men Blue Annual, and that's the one where Eddie was kind of narrating and talking to the symbiote. So I thought maybe they could just keep that going and they could change perspectives in each story. But what they end up doing was each issue is narrated by a different person. And when we get to like the fourth issue when Jean Grey's narrating, uh, which is also an X-Men issue, it's really boring. She's basically just telling you the whole time. She says it like three times. Oh, I think this is the last time I'm going to see Cyclops. I think, And you're just like, wow, could you, have, could you be more obvious about something bad going to happen to her? So when she becomes a poison, you're not even, you know, shocked by it. Uh, so I just it just feels like phoned in on a lot of levels. I feel like maybe, and this is me just speculating, I think Colin Bunn probably came up with a decent story uh, because I actually like the guy's writing. And so I think he probably came up with a cool story, but those emotional elements, he you know, didn't even go near, uh, and he tried to make the emotional crux, okay, it's a father looking for his, uh, a son looking for his father, and then once that happened, it goes right back to, oh, Cy Cyclops lost Jean Grey, and it's just boring. Uh, the one hope it gives me is that maybe we'll learn that the poisons can be destroyed without destroying the hosts, and I'm guessing that's going to be something that happens in Venomized, because obviously Jean has to be saved to some degree. She has to come back to some degree. Maybe not. I mean, you know, they kill everyone in comics, and the main Jean Grey has already come back in comics, like the older Jean Grey, so we don't really need two Jean Greys or a teenager Jean Grey, uh, but again, I mean, I don't think anything bad's going to happen to her because a lot of these stories just feel safe a lot of times, and it doesn't feel like there's a lot of consequences, and that's probably my only critical thing of Colin Bunn is sometimes he writes things, unless if they're set in the main Marvel Universe, they don't feel like they have a ton of consequences to them, uh, so I, I don't expect Jean to be gone for good, but that also gives us hope that maybe she can be saved, which that is a cool story in and of itself as well, uh, because then that means, you know, they can uh, undo these uh these these you know poisons and maybe some characters that have been dead in the marvel universe we have alternate versions of them now in the marvel universe which could be cool uh like this dr doom you know if they if they take the poison off him he's dr doom still and he's the bad guy one whereas the current one in the comics is kind of a trying to be a good guy so that'll be cool the battle of the two dooms at some point uh but i don't know again i don't know if ramifications like that are going to happen or if they're going to wrap this all up with a tiny little bow in Venomized. Uh, but with this, like I said, it just it just feels really like inconsistent. And it feels like the writing styles change, and, I, and the, the art certainly changes. And I think with the editors, I mean, f like two editors and two assistant editors on one book is like, to me, a little ridiculous. And 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 all of them seemingly make seemingly making the wrong decisions with how to pace this thing, with how to, which emotional points to focus on and which points to make action scenes everything just seems wrong like it just it just seems like a bad attempt at you know putting together a, a coherent story especially the story where the first time the x-men meet venom and then it already started off on a bad foot because it's not even the real x-men it's these five kids from an alternate past or whatever so it already rubbed me the wrong way but then diving into it i was trying to give it a chance and the first issue i was like all right i'm kind of on board but then by the second issue and all of them after that i just was kind of like oh there's nuggets of coolness in here and i can see what colin bunn was trying to do but, and I'm not even saying the editors fully interfered. I'm just saying it feels like there was a lot of voices competing for ideas on this and trying to get their ideas in the book. And it, it just didn't work. And then it's like, oh, someone clearly had the idea to have Archangel's wings burn off a symbiote and make a sacrifice. But then they didn't set any of that up in the earlier issues to where you felt like anything when it happened. Uh, so again, it's like, I don't want these things to be like Oscar winning written, but I do want them to be well, at least decently written. And I felt like this one just wasn't for me. And I didn't like the artwork at all either. Uh, so the X-Men Blue Annual, I kind of like the artwork there. But in the single issues, I didn't really care for the art uh, uh, either in those ones. So this one is my least favorite out of all of these. Um, after rereading Edge of Venomverse, I thought, you know what, maybe if I reread Poison X, I'll change my mind like I did with Edge of Venomverse. I ended up liking that a little bit more my you know second time reading through it. This is my third time reading this, and I like it even less than the first time I read it because I noticed more things in here that were inconsistent and were and just not well executed. Uh, but that's, again, just my opinion. I, I still encourage, if you're a Venom fan and an X-Men fan, to pick this up. I'm certainly, I own it in single issue. I'm certainly going to buy it in trade paperback when it comes out. So they're still getting money off me no matter what. Uh, I am that kind of fan where I'll still buy things. Uh, but I'm just being critical. I mean, and and, and you, normally I'm not, you know, I don't like to be this negative, 
but this story just really just didn't do it for me. Uh, but maybe you guys have a different opinion, so if you do, let me know down in the comments below. I would really appreciate that. Am I wrong on something? Did I miss something? Uh, do you think I interpreted something the wrong way that I went over? Let me know down below, and I'm sorry I didn't show a bunch of the interior artwork in this one, but I just really didn't like a lot of the interior, and I thought the covers looked pretty cool enough, so that's why there wasn't a lot of artwork in this episode either. Um, I really just wanted to talk about this and get to the crux of this story and what makes it tick and why specifically I didn't like it so that I wasn't just saying, oh, this book sucks and moving on. I didn't want to do that uh, because this, you know, people worked really hard on this, whether I liked it or not. So it, they deserve that. They at least deserve that for me to tell them why specifically I didn't enjoy the book. Uh, but again, if you have a different opinion, let me know down below. As always, like, uh, as always, thanks for watching my show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.